Hi, my name is Rob Nesbitt, and I'd like to welcome you to my studio, which is in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. The record that is kind of the, you know, the penultimate piece of work I've done in my life. It has a book that comes with it to tell the story of what this record is about and the the instances in my life that that were sort of the most impactful up to a certain point in my life. And that book starts with the line, I grew up in a military household. That was a formative experience for me because yes, I'm moving constantly. And it meant that I had no sense of uh, grounding, you know, I didn't, I had no roots. I was every four years at a, at a maximum, three years was kind of the, the de rigueur. Uh, I would be moving to a new city, a new country sometimes, mostly the United States and Canada. For me, my family moved to France at one point too, but for me it was Canada and America. I was born in the United States, but my family is Canadian. And uh, I had to like meet a new group of kids and try and get into this, the flow of the social scene wherever I ended up. It forced me to become kind of like a, a chameleon in a way. I would, I would subsume my own self to find the, a way to fit quickly and then I would observe the way this, the social system worked wherever I would end up and I would eventually find a more kind of uh, I would find the people I really wanted to be with eventually but at first I was just trying to grab someone to to hold on to um, and this sort of uh, rootlessness is is a part at least a part of why I became such a, a clingy person in my life. And that's sort of what the record is about. It's about this one girl who I sort of put all of these feelings onto and I created a, uh, a monolith person who, who I anchored everything I felt and did on, on this one person's actions and words and everything. And it's some of that, I, after I did the work and figured out why I did what I did. I figured out some of it was true, but I also found out that a lot of it was based in this sort of um, rootless upbringing I had where I felt like I was always trying to hold on to something. And, you know, uh, I talk about in the book how uh, there's, a, there's a particular memory I had with a kid who I was uh, on a field trip with in grade six. And he was, to me, my best friend at that time. And I was trying to get him, I knew I was moving at the end of the school year. And I was trying to get him to tell me that I was his best friend because that was important to me to hear it from someone. I'm actually asking someone to tell me that they love me. That's what that is. And that I'm important to them, that I matter. And uh, he never said it to me. And it's when I think back now, I, I feel a lot of shame and I feel a lot of sadness for that little boy that I was who was always reaching out to people like that and uh, not getting what I needed ultimately. <laughs> it's it's funny, you know. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to become off too maudlin, and I don't want to get too deep into the traumas of my life, whether they're of real value or or uh, impactful to other people or not. But you know, we live our lives, and everything that happens to each of us, something might seem like nothing to one person but to the person that experiences it it is it is what it is and i don't like when people try to minimize other people's pain due to the fact that something worse happens somewhere else whatever happens to the individual that is their life experience and it shapes the way they move forward from that point i i hesitate to speak too expansively on all the little things that happened to me, but that, that is what it is that, that, that up to this point has been what my art experience is. It is the culmination of all these small wounds that I had and have, you know. At the time you met Rona, her name is Rona. That's correct. Yeah. Did you have any musical experiences by that time? I had a love of music and 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 my love of music is one of the factors that plays into the way I met her the way I experienced her when I met her because I was I was absolutely obsessed with pop music uh the Beatles were my favorite band at that point 
Uh, and but I listen to all sorts of like older music standards and so forth. And everything that you listen to within sort of a popular musical frame from about 1940 to at that point, which was the early 1980s, you know, it is it's all very specific mostly boy meets girl boy loses girl kind of lyrics and the the importance the magnitude of these experiences and i took that stuff in and and i internalized it and so i created in my mind what it was to be in love and how you loved a person and how you experienced loss uh in in a devastating way and i'm applying it at that time i'm 13 years old to a 13 year old's life experience and maturity level. So what I was going through was no big deal really, but I made it a big deal. And uh, what the highs were massively high and the lows were abysmal. I've, I've gone far lower in my life later, uh, but at the time it was incapacitating. So, so I had no, I wasn't playing music, but I was listening to music. It, music was my identity. It was forming my identity. I was listening to the things the artists were saying. I was, I was looking at how people like Jim Morrison behaved. And I, I was like, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to be a person who lives physically and broadly and with passion and aggression and with a real fullness for life living on the edge and experiencing on the edge that's what i was kind of i was unconsciously doing these things i was you know i was just taking stuff in and pushing it back out you know so i was loving music but i was just about to start playing guitar when i met her at 13 so i was also wondering if at that time you were longing for a certain stability i'm thinking perhaps rona had um stable family life she didn't move around a lot and did she represent an ideal as as what a family would look like it's interesting to ask that um i don't know if i had the 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 ability to see such a thing my family life in some ways was very stable you know we were always moving but my mom and dad were there they stayed together my father was an alcoholic and so there was this aspect of uh disharmony in the house fear and stuff like that for sure he was he he had quit drinking by the time we moved to maple ridge where i met rona in general you know my mom was home when i got home from school she did everything for me she made my bed she cooked all my meals my mom was incredible like i would come home from punk rock shows at two o'clock in the morning and she would wake up and ask me if i wanted to eat she would make anything i said i want a cake batter and she would make me a cake so i could eat the batter like she was very doting and uh, some of that was because she knew how little i got from my dad and she was trying to give me as much as she could and uh now when i looked at rona's family yeah maybe they they were they did it everybody appeared stable to me because i would just land in these neighborhoods and these people seemed to have been there their whole lives they knew everybody at school they'd been with them since kindergarten or whatever and i was always just kind of dropped in the middle that might have been part of it but but the fact of the matter is like when i went to kindergarten and i met girls i wanted to marry them as soon as i saw them like i i i wanted to settle down when i was a little tiny boy and i think that stuff is rooted in exactly what you're talking about i was trying to create a life that was going to ensure that i had a person that was with me and uh that's all coupled with the fact that i was in love with the idea of love like i really i believed in it like a fairy tale you know and uh it became like more than a hobby it was it was everything i don't know like I love romanticism. It's I still do. I have a different view of it now, but I still believe in the in its power and capacity. You know. You sound sometimes like a troubadour, you know, going around singing your love and so dedicated to the idea, the concept of love. Yeah. 
That's that's a beautiful thing to say. Thank you very much. I I would love to think of myself as that. However, the only difference between me and troubadours is they actually had talent, right? Like I don't have any talent. I uh, I have an acquired set of skills that I've honed with with an unbelievable amount of dedication to allow me to do the thing I do at the the meager level I do it. Those people who used to, to walk around and, and sing for their supper, they were talented people. They had the ability to play and to sing in such a way that it would move people instantly. You know, I'm a, I'm a very manipulative artist. I'm, I'm using every trick in the book to try to get across what I'm doing. And uh, it's sort of successful. Like, that's where I sit, you know? It takes a lot of dedication to go that deep into your emotions to dissect yourself mm -hmm. you literally did an autopsy of your love of your feelings and then you did another one to just to be sure that the first autopsy was a good one interesting way to put it yeah that's that's a it's funny, yeah. That's, a, that's a, I've never thought about that before, but it's true, and it's an apt uh, metaphor, I think, because by the time I started working on the music that became the Sweet Sixteen, I was convinced that I looked at it as this child inside of me, and I believed that he was dead, like he was at least, well, no, I'd probably say dead, you know. Um, and I was working on looking at the mechanical aspects of how this person lived and died uh, but I found that his ghost was still around and uh, he still kind of is you know and uh, but yeah that that's exactly who it is I sifted through the debris and wreckage of a person's uh, romantic life and tried to make sense of why it all happened and it's funny because I came to all sorts of interesting conclusions and I really did learn and I did heal. When I really started getting to the meat of the recording of this record, I actually healed. I, uh, there was a really important moment. One of the first sessions I did, I recorded a song called The List. One of the, the last line I sing in the song is, I'll list the way things will be when we're married. And as I sang that song, <laughs> I started to cry. And that's, that healing happened all it took me it took me like i don't know it took about six years or something like that to record the record no maybe five years and all through that time i was just i was that's all i did i was absolutely immersed in it and it healed me in such a way it's not over but boy is it ever over compared to what it used to be <laughs> how did you start bump your your band yeah, um, most people would consider that to be the most uh, important work I ever did was the work I did with the band Bum. Uh, I had done high school. I got out of high school. I started working at a record store, and I still wasn't a good guitar player, but I'd played with some people by that point, so I had an idea of what it was to play in a band with people. I also had an idea of what I wanted to do in a band with people, and when I worked at this record store, it was the record store of the city I lived in, the most important place. It was where all the, all the punks came to get the records. It was where the posters went up for shows. It was the hub of in really punk culture in my city, which made it the coolest place, in my opinion, in the city. And the people who worked there were all musicians. And so I struck up a friendship with all of them, really. But one guy in particular named Andrew Malloy um, was someone I worked with. And I found that he and I had a, a real similar view of things. We, A lot of people were into metal or extreme dream punk, that kind of stuff, avant-garde music. He and I were really into pop music. We liked all that other stuff too, but you know, our, our, our hearts lay in sort of this AM radio sort of space. And we wanted to make music that was that type of music, even though we could almost couldn't admit it at that point, because we, we didn't even have the tools or the language, but we knew that was where what the kind of stuff we liked, but we were punk rockers too. And we were also super limited as to what we could do. Um, our talents were such that, that we weren't able to do very much with our music. And so we decided to get together and start playing. And I remember my concept at the time was uh, I wanted a band like the Descendants, but 
my ultimate goal is I wanted to fuse the Smiths and Black Flag together. I wanted a hyper emotional melodic band that was just punishingly aggressive. Um, so like, you know, just super loud guitars, very forward, aggressive, passionate energy, but singing hopefully beautiful melodies, um, heartbreaking, a very personal. And uh, that was what Bum was supposed to be for me. Andrew is is the 50% 50, 50 of that band. The other guys are super important too. You cannot underlook how important the other two members are. But, you know, Andrew's concept and my concept met and we made this very specific thing. So that started in about 1988. And we started playing together, but we didn't start writing original music. We played covers for a couple of years, but we didn't start writing uh, original music until about 1989. In 1990, it really actually sort of started to get serious. So Then you took your music to different places, different countries. Yes. You have become very well known in Spain. That's, that's yeah, the, the place we, we got famous, you know, and, and uh, it's interesting because we actually, at that time when we did one tour of Spain, when I was in the band and we, we were famous there as far as a band like us can be. Uh, the first time we came out of our hotel and walked down a concourse to go to the record store, that was sort of, they were promoting the, the shows that we were doing. They were our record label in Spain. Well, they did the, the live album anyway. And uh, people came out of places to see us and talk to us. And it was just unlike anything we'd ever experienced before because we were marginally successful at home. But here, people like looked at us the way we looked at, at other important bands. And it was a, it was a beautiful... I'm so grateful for what I got to experience on that trip, you know. Then you decided to make a shift, a change. You went on your own and became part of other bands. But at the same time, you were a sole performer. And you were working, at the same time you were working on a, on a record, this one. Well... So all the music, basically, with the exception of maybe two songs in, in the bum oeuvre of music, what the catalog that we have, all of my songs were about the same thing. They were all about that experience of meeting that girl when I was 13 years old and the ensuing years that I spent with her on and off afterwards. It was a continuation. When I left bum, I was, uh, I, music and I were at a very bad place. I I, I hated the business of music. It, it hurt me deeply. And uh, I hated the music of the 1990s. I just, it, I loathed it. Uh, I was jealous of everyone who was famous and, and doing things that I was incapable of doing. And plus, I didn't like the sounds they were making. Um, so when I left Bum, I was just so disillusioned. I felt I had nothing left. I had no authenticity or integrity. I was just trying to be a version of the person I was when I was younger. It was just a course of like, what, six years or something like that. But I had a real nostalgic view of things even then, uh, right or wrong. And uh, so I went back to the music of my very youth. I started like buying records that were on the radio when I was a little kid and really trying to get back to the heart of what, why I loved music in the past. And so I started playing hardcore music, hardcore punk rock again, because I'd done that in the 80s as well, um, because it's a very expressive form that asks very little of you in a lot of ways, but you can get a lot out of it. And I started, I was in a tribute band called the Astro Zombies, which is a tribute to the band, the Misfits. And that was very important that doing that was, I learned about process. I lived as the lead singer of the Misfits, Glenn Danzig, for like two years of my life. All I did was things that I thought Glenn Danzig would have done when he was in the Misfits. I worked out all the time. I went to graveyards. I wore only black clothes. I grew my hairstyle in a very certain way. I immersed myself in becoming as perfect as I could a version of his character at the time he was in that band, which was in the late 70s, early 80s. The two or three years I spent doing the Astro Zombies, immeasurably important. I was just, I can't 
again, this seems stupid to people. I was in a tribute band to this dumb punk band that almost no one knew at that time. But I took it as seriously as you can take anything. And I, I drove my bandmates to extremes. Uh, we practiced in this gigantic meat locker, solid concrete walls, no windows, like 25 foot high ceilings. And I would make them practice in the pitch black so that they would know every chord without ever having to look at their instruments. I wanted us to be completely muscle memory so that we were dangerous. That's what I wanted us to feel like. And I got a note from a guy the other day and he said, I saw you guys perform and it felt like something violent was about to happen in the room. And that's exactly what I was trying to create because they were a horror band. And, you know, I could never be the vocalist that Glenn Danzig was. He's an absolutely phenomenal talent. Uh, but I, I embodied him without a doubt. I became a caricature almost of what he was. And uh, I spent a, f a massive amount of money on what I was doing. And it cost me physically and mentally. But man, did I learn a lot about what it was to commit to something and uh, have other people commit to it too. Is the, and the, 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 the feeling of camaraderie that engenders, you know? So yeah, I did those two things. And then I started, once I kind of like, got back into music to that i started working seriously on creating the songs that became mine would be the sun the album that the sweet 16 released three years ago now yeah so those but those two things were very important playing hardcore and playing in the misfits band super important to what that album became during this time you were also working in that video store wow yes that's true i yeah a video store called pick a flick video which i eventually ended up owning and the owning of that store made the creation of mine would be this impossible because it was a store that was very popular and it, it earned me a lot of money for a very short period of time. And part of what I did with that money was invested in making the record. And uh, it cost a, a fortune. And uh, it's, a, it's money I will never see ever again. Uh, I, I have piles of these records sitting in my house that cost so much so that when when i brought them back over the border from the united states the customs agent couldn't believe it and he took it around to show the people because he's like this this guy spent this much money on these things and uh but i had to do it it had to be this specific thing because i i'm old guy now like i i will never get a chance probably to do anything like this ever again and I was obsessed with making with, with the bands who made the records I loved, bands like Fleetwood Mac and their album Rumors or Def Leppard's Hyster uh, Pyromania, not Hysteria, and how these people went to these lengths. You know, Fleetwood Mac worked seven days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day on Rumors. That's all they did. And, and they made, a, in my opinion, a perfect sonic record. It's incredible. And I wanted to do those things so badly. And, uh, and so I used money to, to make it happen. I, I paid to, to live out that dream and, uh, man, it, it isn't perfect. Um, and it isn't for everyone like rumors is, but man, I, I got close, you know, like I look at the bands I love and they're like, they're way up here. I'll try to hit the top of the screen, you know, and this is me. I almost touched it. Like I'm, so grateful for what I got to do. I don't know. It's so important. And it, it, it's kind of been a real, it's painful to me that these records sit here and it, it's, uh, it, it's a weird, bittersweet thing, but I wouldn't trade anything I did and how much I suffered making that album. Most of the time during my life, when people come to see me perform for the first time, they're like, oh, I can't believe that's you. Like, cause I am kind of a just a quiet gentle guy that's that's what i am that's what i like but i'm a human being and there exists in me a bunch of facets right and when i'm on stage the facet that is most often utilized for performance is anger it's violence it's power it's aggression that's what i am i am I've always said that I, I don't I don't get excited like some people do when they perform live. You know, people talk about the roar of the crowd and how it makes you that some people feel a great sense of love, right? Like they get that feeling of love that, that I'm talking about wanting from those experiences. I don't get that. Even though people are very kind and they 
they you know they they appreciate what's happening and they participate i am inside myself and this is again a fa- this is a, a failing of mine i am inside myself i am not in the moment i am in my mind and i am at war with myself on stage i am at war with my past with the things i've experienced um i don't know what video you've seen me play but i mean i've done a lot of shows and i can remember tons of ex- specific exist- instances and there are moments where i'm not singing that i'm playing guitar and my teeth are clenched so tight that it hurts and i'm screaming at the guitar and i'm not screaming anything intelligible i'm just yelling fuck like as hard as i can as i'm smashing my guitar i can't i'm not a good player i'm like pete townsend is my hero because he's he is a really good player but he was always about the limitations when i'm playing my guitar i am punishing it i am i am grabbing it and pulling sound out of it and that's what being on stage is for me it's it's brutal and uh it's fun to a degree sometimes it isn't but it's 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 serious fucking business for me and uh i it, it's important to me that that exists because again i'm trying to show people who i am and no one is any one thing i'm not just a soft sweet boy like do not fuck around like i i am serious that's that's a part of me too you know and it's it it's about honesty as well like that's i'm just showing you what's what i am i'm a beast right like people are full of all this stuff and they try to hide it sometimes and it's this stuff is not to be hidden this is like embrace it it's a part of who we are our experience here i looked at the lyrics and for someone who was in punk rock Your lyrics are very gentle in many many ways. They reflect indeed that pain, that anguish. But you don't fall into that anger that we've seen in other bands where they literally trash their <laughs> right. the women in their lives, you know, the past lovers. I feel an ease come on my shoulders when you say that cuz If if there's something I regret about the the oeuvre I work in, I feel that there is sort of underlying misogyny in it, and uh, that really, it's 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 almost like it's like a if 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 you look at like pop punk is where some people think I operate or power pop or whatever, but this this idea of pop music, whether it's pop punk or power pop or whatever, it operates on this us versus them paradigm right it's men versus women boys versus girls really let's get serious like this is about people who are immature and and, and uh it's it's about how they did something wrong and it hurt me right like and i operate from that 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 duality and it's not accurate it's not real like the the girl i sing about she's a real person and she's not a monster like to be defeated but that's the way i approached it the way i perceived what happened between us has very little to do with her and a lot to do with me i orchestrated our demise ultimately by being the person i was and that's sort of what part of what the album is about right if you listen to it and you knew it as deeply as i know it i i can see all the moments where i'm i'm recognizing that but there's plenty of moments where i i i feel like i am laying the blame And there's a, the last song on the album is called Why I Love You and I Did and it's it's the apology song. And uh God it's I'm sitting here almost crying again. I cry a lot. Like I'm a super <laughs> sappy dude and uh things that touch me, they touch me and it's some of it sometimes is my own stuff. And what can I say? I I'm apologize, but uh that song Why I Love You and I Did is an apology and and it's the first thing it says is um I want to tell you why I love you and I did cuz all I seem to sing about is how I feel that you let me down and that's not fair. Like But I I feel that in so many people's music. I like I the Descendants, one of my most important bands. I I feel like we we 
I don't think I've done it all that much, but I think there's an, an edge of being cruel and like unreasonably so to some of this stuff. And I, I don't like it. I don't think it's very evolved and I don't think it's very enlightened. And um, I hope if I start writing more music, I can kind of move away from that stuff a bit more, but I really appreciate that you don't hear it. Like, I think that's important. Thank you. During this time, Wendy was part of your life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's I met Wendy in in uh, 1991, and I was in the throes of this the 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 wreckage. You know, it had happened a year before the breakup, the real breakup, the final breakup. So I was 21 years old. I met her Rona when I was 13, and 21 was the end of us. And I met Wendy. And I didn't want a relationship. I didn't want anything. And Wendy, I, I said, if some, some girl wants to go out with me, she's going to have to chase me down. And Wendy chased me down. And she was an incredible person, just so kind and so giving. And the first day we went out, I vowed to myself, I'm going to tell her everything. If she asks me a question, she gets the absolute truth because that's the only place I'm going to operate from, from here on in. I can't live in this fantasy like I used to. I have to be who I am. Frankly, a little bit of an asshole, not as much as I was in high school to my high school girlfriend, Debbie, but just kind of a self-involved jerk, okay? But she needs to know that's who I am. That's where I'm at. I can also be a beautiful guy and super nice and all that stuff, but there's a lot of self-involvement here. And she needed to know this up front. And she did, she took it all in. And she said, I'm going to love you anyway. And so what would I have done if I didn't have her? I don't know. Like she stayed with me all through the period when I wrote all these songs and sat on stages all over the place singing about this one person. I have a couple of Wendy songs too, and they're great. <laughs> but, you know, I was mostly singing about this other thing, but she understood how important it was to me and how, how burdened I was by it and how damaged I was by it. And so she allowed me to work through it. And, and it's an incredible gift. I don't know. I don't think if this was a movie, that wouldn't have happened, right? Like they wouldn't allow a woman to subsume herself like that in the name of, of giving their, their partner the freedom to live their life the way they needed to. She, I'm not a normal person. Like I, I'm weird. I'm obsessive. And, and I couldn't be any other way to make me do any other path it would be inauthentic and i don't know what it would do to me you know maybe it'd be healthy i don't know but wendy's super important i saw the pictures that you took from hmm. your concerts in the yeah. bathroom <laughs> yeah after your haircut she would travel with bums sometimes when we weren't going too far away to seattle or whatever and take pictures of us in vancouver and here and some of them are, there, there's a picture behind me. Whoop. That's the most famous bum promo photo. And that Wendy took that in my apartment. And, uh, you know, lots of pictures that ended up inside of records and covers of records and so on and so forth. So, yeah, she was integral to that aspect, too. She's the, the biggest photo documentarian of the band, without a doubt. Um, so she's a very talented photographer, like a true artist. She helped me with the Sweet 16 in that when I made the book, she went back with me uh, to Maple Ridge where a lot of the growing up in the story took place. And we took pictures of my school and the places I would hang out and my house and Rona's house and stuff. Again, like so giving, right? She's, she's allowing herself to become a part of my insanity and makes my thing better by, by just being involved with it. And, and uh, she, she shot the cover photo too, which, is uh, it's uh, this cover of this record, which is based on a photograph by another photographer, is a story unto itself. Uh, it took almost two years to make. I had to build basically a section of a room in Wendy's studio to recreate an apartment that I'd seen a photograph of. And Wendy shot this photo and it, it was a, it's a very, very big deal, very laborious. And uh, she did an incredible job, but um, her photography is integral to my work, as far as I'm concerned. She's a, she's a part of it, yeah. So there are only 500 pieces. Only. 
<laughs> seems like plenty to me uh yes there are 500 copies of the album and uh yeah i got i got lots see it it, it came out in january 27th 2020 like i had covid when i went to pick up the album and i didn't even know it and uh i came home was very very sick for a couple of weeks released the record then the whole world changed and i pulled the record and didn't sell it for several months because i was just like what is happening i felt so awful about the people suffering in the world i'm i can't promote this goofy vanity project while people are suffering and dying like it just didn't seem right but then it didn't stop and i'm like i gotta do something i gotta release this thing again so i i did put it back up but the damage was done like the the year it came out i i'm i'm proud and grateful to say that the people who did get a hold of it it made a whole bunch of best of the year lists and i was on the long list for the polaris music prize which is probably in my opinion the highest music prize in canada i didn't get close to even winning but just to be in that consideration is incredible so it, it had a great impact but it's over like if you can't tour and i'm not touring i'm not playing with people because of covid you can't sell your record so here i am stuck with it <laughs> How can people buy it? It's it's available. It's on Bandcamp. You can get it there or you can contact me directly. It's easily available as far as I'm concerned. But I can't promote it. I just, I mean, I guess that's what I'm doing here in a way. But to me, this is just about talking about art. Like this isn't promoting my album. I can't stand the business of music. It just makes me sick. Like, ugh. So I, like if people say, oh, you should do this and you should do that. Make sure you post to Instagram. I'm just like, I've done enough. Like I, I don't have a record label. I don't have a manager or anybody to help me. I'm just doing it on my own. And, and I've done all I can do. It's just, it's out there and people want it. They can get it. Maybe someday I'll start playing music again in a live capacity. And maybe I can sell some, but as of right now, it's just it's this sort of like, it's behind me. Like you can't see it, but there's boxes of it behind me and in the hallway behind me. And it's like a specter that just looms in my life. And, I love it so much and I want it gone so much. <laughs> I see two guitars behind you. Oh yeah, there's some here too. Yeah, they're all over the place. I looked at um, the credits and you seem to have played a lot of instruments. Yeah, this is uh, a, a thing that again, much like my journey through the heartbreak, and Wendy allowing me to make the journey. The journey through the record was a similar thing in that I felt like I had to do everything because I had to make it as personal as I could possibly make it. That meant that I had to touch every aspect of the record. And this is an interesting component of the piece, but it's also to its detriment. Too much of me is gross. Like it's, it's, it makes it singular but it doesn't make it a stronger piece of work. I don't think, at least it doesn't make it a more enjoyable piece of work. I think that's more accurate. You know, you, you want to be, you want to appeal broadly to people and you want people to like what you do. The more personality you inject into things, the more singular it becomes and the more limited it becomes, unless you are a very special person um, like Neil Young say, that guy, he's got a weird voice but he's a genius and Dylan, you know, absolute genius. And so he, there people are going to respond to this on a large scale because it's just so special. You know, the more I try to, I, I don't try to sound like myself. I'm trying to sound like Karen Carpenter or whatever, but the, the more I, I put my hands on the things I do, the more it becomes me. And so the less appealing it becomes. Um, the guy I worked with, the producer who, producer engineer david carswell that i worked with you know he made it plain that he understood this and uh he would i would bring in the music i had written up to that point the, and recorded and he'd load it into the system and bring it and he'd be like this is great like i cannot wait to work on this and then i'd start singing and my singing voice a singing voice is the most personal thing you can have right it's more than a guitar it is coming directly out of the flesh of your body it is your expression and I'd start singing, he'd be like, <laughs> you know, like he said, he'd said, I remember for one song, we need a leading man for this. Like this needs a leading man. 
And once I'd started working on it, he'd say, you know, we need a star and you're just Jason Sudeikis. <laughs> and I don't know if you know who Jason Sudeikis is, but he, at the time he said that Jason Sudeikis was like a very competent comedic actor who was always the friend in movies you know and uh and i he made me laugh but he hurt me all the time but he was honest and real and true and he never told a lie about what i was doing and uh his his compliments meant all the more because i knew when he said something was good that it was good dave has impeccable taste and uh but he's right like the, the more I did on it, the less good it was. So the times I let other people do things, play bass or play drums or whatever, I originally played all the drums electronically and then hired drummers because Dave convinced me to do that. And that was a massive leap forward. Um, and those drummers, they gave a, a part of the soul of the record to it. So I wanted to tell you that your voice seemed very clear, the timber. I... I listened to Iggy Pop and I listened to Lena Cohen throughout their yes. years, you know, their voices changed. Yeah. Yeah. Iggy, especially, hey, like, yeah, he's very different now, I think. At least I hear it. Um, it's like everything with me. It's sheer willpower. Like, if I, I, I don't have a lot going for me, my will, at least it used to be, it's a little weaker now. My whole thing is kind of weak <laughs> but my willpower is it's unshakable like so uh I, I i have to sound the best i possibly can the way i conceive myself i i always basically i was trying to sound like a teenage girl that's what i would hope for um and uh i don't i know that but that's kind of where i'm trying to be and so i can sing pretty high and it's just because i'm forcing myself to do it there's no ease to my vocal if a vocal coach listened to me they'd be like oh there's so much tension in your body and in your face and they're right i have my technique is bad but i'm tr i'm trying to achieve something and i sort of get it and some people like it and most people don't <laughs> so where are you right now i'm in a very strange place covid has done a lot of weird things to my brain I lost my mother in 2015, right after Bum reunited for a few short years to do some shows. And then this past year, I lost my father. I also lost a very close friend during COVID and not, not neither of them to COVID, uh, to other things. My father to cancer, my other friend to alcoholism. My record died. The thing that I had placed all of my heart and hopes on for 20 years of my life was born and almost was a stillbirth. I sold my business. Uh, I'm all, uh, essentially retired and I'm here after this pandemic, which in my opinion is still going on and will go on for who knows how long. And I am mentally very much in the pandemic still. I don't hardly go outside. I try my best to keep myself safe and distant. Um, even though I've had it, I may be immune for all I know, but I'm changed. My brain is changed. I'm afraid. And uh, I don't play music with my friends anymore. And that is very sad to me because it's one of the great pleasures of my life. I'm not really writing. I'm not really doing anything. I'm like in stasis. I'm on hold and I don't know how or when I'm going to get out of it. Part of that's because I was taking care of my father for the last year before he died. Um, and that just made everything pause even further than it already was because of the pandemic. But it's the coming out the other side hasn't begun yet, really. I'm kind of starting to get a little bit of my spark and light back, which was gone for a long time. But We'll see what happens. It's going to have to be a very conscious reawakening, I think, and an application of myself to life. I don't know if I've got the strength to do it just yet, but soon, I hope. We'll see. It would be interesting to actually write songs about this isolation that you're experiencing right now. I have one song that was released at the very beginning of the pandemic, and uh, I wrote it like it was written in early April of 2020. And at the time I was, in, I was ecstatic about what was happening. Um, not, not about the sickness aspect, the shutdown aspect. I loved that everyone stopped. I loved that the world just stopped and slowed down because I feel like everything is just 
constantly moving and it's always struggling to move forward and progress. And I'm just like, can you be able to take it easy and not pressure people to do so much? Like that, that period where I was just like, you don't have to do anything. Just sit down and watch TV. That's what everybody was doing, right? Just watching TV. And uh, I was like, oh, thank God. So I wrote a song about that. It's the, the, the problem is I was so obsessed with my heartbreak and so convinced of its validity. I was like a religious zealot. No one could have told me I was wrong. Uh, uh, you know, it's like the things I'm saying, they're as true as they can be. And I'm saying them in a way that is authentic and honest. And if you think it's not good, you're wrong. Like I would just say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand what I'm doing. I don't feel like that anymore. I don't have anything. Like I, I can't keep writing about the same thing. I'm kind of over it in a way. It's the, the residual oh, painful sweetness just sits there inside of me. But I don't have anything else to say about it, really. I have some songs that are ready to go that I wrote before and I've kind of completed in the last few years, but I don't know how much I want to talk about any of this stuff. And I really, I, like, I want to talk about spiritual things. That's what I would love to write about. Like, I, I want to talk about things about the way I now understand what it is to create music and how that happens and the universal spiritual importance of the act of creation but I have no confidence in it. I don't have confidence in my ability to talk about it. You know, the, the, there's a, a, a term called the ineffable, ineffable, yes? That is uh, the inability for words to express the unexpressible. And that's where I'm at. I'm in that place of, of finding that. And I find myself in grossly inadequate. I can't, I can't talk about it. Not yet. I've written a couple of things that I think are okay, but I see other people doing the thing I want to do. And I, uh, my confidence just isn't there. I don't know. It might come, but we'll see. There's also a part of me that's like, you know what, Rob, you got to get outside of yourself and just work and let that spirituality flow through you. Make music that you know will make people happy. Try to do that. And that's enough. So I'm coming from a couple of different places and, and uh, it's, a, it's sort of like a rebuilding time, I guess, right now. And who knows how long it will take. It took me 20 years to make mine would be the sun. It may take me another 20 years to be able to be the kind of person musically, creatively that I would like to be. I don't know. I'm just a, I'm a mess. <laughs> but at the same time, you were loyal to your own principles. You were not a pleaser. And we live in a society where if you want to have a good job, you have to please. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I got to thank you for seeing these things in me. Like that's, I've been thinking about it as I'm waiting for this interview to happen. And, and you know, every single person on this earth has this story. Their life is a book that is constantly being written and it's, so deep and it's so full of pathos and pain and joy and every single person needs deserves to be recognized and that's what we want you know that's that's why i i've done the work i've done it's it goes right back to the beginning of what we were talking about this feeling of being rootless and how i just was looking for a person to be with me forever because you just want to be seen you know people want to connect and they want another person to know them. I've made this thing that tells you up to that point, every, this, is, this is a roadmap to me. This tells you everything you need to know about me. If you read the book and you diligently listen to the songs and the way I construct the melodies and the words I'm saying, that's me. And that's all I want is for, it's again, yeah, it's, it's, it's this elemental thing of wanting connection and wanting to be loved, you know? And I'm not talking in a, in, I'm talking in a big way, like love, the kind of love that is in everything. That's, that is the fabric of what this experience of being alive is. That's, I realize what I'm trying to get to. It is the essence of who I am and my ability to see it and feel it and express it, you know? Your album is also very cathartic. 
Yeah, it is. Um, again, I don't know if you get that from listening to it. I, 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 I've heard from people, so I get an understanding from what people are getting from it. One of the beautiful things I get from people is they talk about how they listen to it and then they went and they pulled out their yearbook from high school and they started looking at the pictures of the people and looking for the girl that they loved or the boy. I don't hear from many women. It's kind of a guy thing. Let's be real. Like this, this music I make is sort of guy centric and I'm not happy about that. It's just the way it is. And they talk about remembering friends and experiences. And I haven't thought about that person in years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm like, that's, that is what it is, man. Like people want to forget high school. They think it's dumb. They think it's painful. It is painful. And it's a little dumb, but so is adulthood. Everything's dumb. It's like, we're just silly creatures living this existence, you know, but people belittle the feelings of children. And I think, I think children feel in a way that adults do not. And they feel with a depth and, and a, a wholeheartedness that is, you don't have it when you're older. It's different. The places you're coming from, so much grief in adulthood, you know, so much uh, guardedness, uh, a lot of pain feeling. But when you're little, you just love stuff. You love it. Yeah. That's why I love teen idols. I have a picture right in front of me as I work on music. It's a picture of Justin Bieber from maybe the first or second year he was around. And I love him because he embodies this thing, this icon for little girls to love. And that's a great gift, man. Like that's, God, I'm getting emotional again. This is ridiculous. I guess it's because I'd hardly speak to anybody anymore. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I see little girls freaking out about something like Justin Bieber, people think it's stupid. And I think it's incredible. I think those girls are living life to the maximum potential of that moment. They are throwing their hearts 100% at an, uh, 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 an avatar, an icon, a deity. They are, they are putting themselves into that moment. And they don't even know what they're doing. But they are, they are instinctually living out em emotionality to its absolute maximum level at that moment. That's a beautiful thing, man. Like, what are you doing, average human adult who would criticize these children to live like that? You just go to work. You just come home. You pay your bills. It's like you have loves and you have losses. but it And some of those things may be equal to those kids. But how dare you belittle or minimize what they're going through, you know? You talked about spirituality. What yes. soothes you these days? Yeah, well, after my mom died and I experienced grief for the first time for real, like uh, I, I'm a person, <laughs> I often say I was raised by like Donahue and stuff like that. I grew up in a time in culture, North American culture, when it was all about self-help and self-examination, at least in, in a very sort of me, me, me way, you know, very, very self-involved reflection. Um, so I was in touch with my feelings ever since I was a very little boy. Like that was a big thing for me. I've never been afraid to express how I feel and, and stuff. And I thought I really knew myself, but when my mom died and the grief that came two years after she died, I kept thinking, Oh, this is not so bad. And when it arrived, nothing I had done in my life prepared me for what that was. I've never experienced pain like that. Uh, it, 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 it's 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 unreal. It's a very it's a very different realm to anything I lived through before, and I became very depressed and I became truthfully suicidal for the first time in my life. I've been through minor suicidal moments in my life because of things, but this was something else. And I got very worried, and I got I got sure that I was never going to be happy again. And uh, I thought, I have to do something. I have to figure out a way to get past this because this is just, it's unlivable. And uh, so I began to meditate and um, I got into Buddhism and I started practicing Soto Zen Buddhism. And it's, it is a part of my life every single day. And uh, it's changed my life. It's not an easy thing to do, but I work at it and uh, it's helped me so much. I, I got into it because I wanted enlightenment. I wanted a salvation for myself, right? I had to save myself. And what you don't realize 
when you're starting this sort of path is that's not really what it's about. It's about you doing the work. And as you do it, you care for other people more and more and more. And you realize that you are other people. Like you're caring for yourself as your capacity for compassion for other people grows. And you don't even, it's not an exercise. This is just a thing that happens within the practice. And uh, so I'm, I'm doing this and I'm feeling more and more compassion to, towards other people. And it's beautiful because it's getting me closer to the thing I was talking about again before, this, this idea of love that is the center fabric of everything we are. And uh, it's the thing I wanted since I was a little boy. Um, I just didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't clearly see what it was. And uh, I'm getting closer to that all the time. So meditation soothes me and my practice soothes me. My feelings towards the world and nature and other people. That's when I can see it, when I'm not in the midst of my grief for my father's passing now or my confusion about COVID or the failure of my record. And I can get to the heart of what's really happening here. It's very peaceful and exciting and full of life. And I love it. The fact that you're living in the moment. And Trying to, yes. <laughs> Struggling, yeah. At the Sorry. same time, uh, validating your emotions. You're not negating them. You're acknowledging them. You're validating them. The good thing that you did not acknowledge because probably it, it's inherent right now. Rona is alive. Yeah. Her energy is alive around you. Imagine how would it be if she didn't exist anymore. You would have to come to a different understanding with a different interpretation that she's uh, alive yeah well that that's a really that's a profound and beautiful thing for you to say like but the fact of the matter is she like so much of what my experience with her is is based in this storybook that i created in myself let's just say i don't give it enough credence that she's an alive human being one of my greatest desires, my greatest like, fantasy wishes is that we were still friends because we are friends, like we're Facebook friends or whatever. But like, I really liked her, you know, like we were friends first before I fell in love with her, although I kind of fell in love with her the second I saw her. But, you know, we hung out a lot and I just, I found her really funny and she had a good nature and, and uh, I just had a lot of fun with her. And there's plenty of songs I've written where I say in the song, all I wanted to do was know you. And, uh, or I knew you. I say that a lot too. Like it's convincing myself, reminding myself that this is a thing that happened. She is a person that I spent time with, but so much more so in my deluded mind, she's a, a, a concept, you know, but you're right. She is alive and she's having a life right now. And I just wish I knew her because I know she'd be fun to know. Like, But that could be said about so many people, people in my own town. You know, she lives across the water from me and my friends I knew back then. It's like, I wish I knew so many people, but her spirit, I, I really would need to consider what you just said to me there and take some time to think about that because I think it's there's something there that I haven't thought about. And I think it would be very, I think it would be soothing and it would be, it would give me some different perspective too. In a few weeks, we are entering a new year. <laughs> what are your hopes? I don't really know if I have hopes as of right now. I, I know I have, like, I don't, I'm not, I've never been the kind of person for New Year's resolutions, you know? I always figure like, sometimes you can't, I, I, I've never, I don't, it's funny because I, I, I'm a total traditionalist in a lot of ways, um, but I, I, I don't like arbitrary rules to things. Like, like most of my life, I haven't liked Valentine's Day. It's like, you shouldn't tell me what day I can give presents and be a sweetheart, you know, like just do it all the time. 
But this year, I actually have some sort of goal type stuff. I have a specific meditation path that I want to take for the next year. Um, and I think that's going to help me. And I need to start physically being more active because I'm getting older. And this past year, looking after my dad, I've really let myself fall into a sort of a, a sort of a sloth like mode because I'm always just feeling like I'm trying to comfort myself, you know, and I see comfort in a, in a very easy, lazy path. I just want to not do anything. I just want to play my video game or sit on the couch with Plan B or eat cookies or whatever, right? And I need to start physically getting out and doing more for my body so I can become physically more connected to the now. And uh, that will help in some ways. So I'm looking at ways that are going to help me find my way back towards living in the world a little more. I really don't know if I'm ever going to go to a show ever again or play a show ever again. I don't know right now. feels like not, but I know myself well enough and I've had enough experience now to know that I can't say things like never. I used to say that kind of stuff all the time. I'm absolutely sure this will never happen. I will never do this. I will never say that. That doesn't exist. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to try and work towards hopefully getting a bit more integrated back into uh, some bigger living this coming year. We'll see. I really like the fact that you chose the name of your album Sweet 16 after an erotic thriller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I got that name almost before most of the songs were written. I, that, was, that came very, very early. Uh, 1996, I think. Um, and I just... Finding a band name is really hard. In case you didn't notice, I'm in a band called Bum. It's uh, the dumbest name maybe that has ever existed, especially for a band that's so serious in a lot of ways. Like Andrew and I are very serious, emotional dudes, and we are in this band that has a stupid name. But maybe that's a part of the appeal, right? Like we don't, we are serious, but we also understand how silly we are. And so that's the dichotomy. And maybe that's interesting. But so finding, finding a cool band name, that's what a guy would hope for when he starts a band or a, a, any person. And uh, I have some band names that I think are so amazing that I've heard. And I wanted something like that. I like numbers a lot. And so the fact that it had a number in it really appealed to me. So, <laughs> What would you like the viewers to take away from this interview? Sometimes, like, even though I'm a person who's not ashamed to express themselves like in an experience like this like i've cried like three times during this interview i feel a kind of a shame about that stuff like i'm so raw and open and and exposed like i don't think a lot of i think there's plenty of people who find that stuff kind of gross and i don't blame them but i do think it's important and i think it's true I don't know. I guess what I'm hoping, just like always, I'm just hoping that someone watches this and someone, the rare person, sees me and they're like, that guy's worth checking out because he's, he's, he's got something to say. Like his story is worth something. And, uh, and then they do. And maybe they actually enjoy the work I do. Like so much of what I do is this heavy, like, oh, this is a guy who's trying to, like, tell this burdensome story about his kind of ridiculous heartbreak. But underneath it, sometimes like, people actually enjoy the music. And uh, that's, I'm so grateful for that. All I ever wanted was a record on the radio, you know, and uh, just for everyone to be singing. And sometimes I get that when we go to Spain and stuff. And sometimes some of the shows we've played in the last few years I never played a Sweet 16 show, so I've never had people sing these lyrics back to me. Um, but that's all I ever thought I wanted was just having people connect with my work and enjoy it. Like just, no one can dance to bum music. We would play shows and people, we'd play for like sometimes for people who weren't punk rockers and they try to dance, but it's like, <laughs> I wish I could make music that people like could move to a little easier. Um, and I just want them to like it and and be pleased by it. So yeah, I guess it's about seeing me thinking that's of value, taking a bit of a dive and maybe enjoying the actual product I made, you know. Now when I talk about 
it, what I do when I'm crying and my bullshit, it's gross. That's again, this is, this is the duality of life, right? There is the delusional side of life where we are wrapped up in our stories and we have judgments about other people. And they're, when I say it's gross, that's talking about me. Like that's my stuff, right? Um, I remember I, I was playing a song at my mom's funeral thing we had at my sister's farm where she was being buried under this tree. And I sang this Holly song that my mom loved. And I was talking about her and I was just a mess. Like it was, I was just going to say it was gross. And it was, I felt disgusting. Like I was just like all snotty and teary. And I was like reeling in front of my family back and forth is what it seemed like a, like a drunk, someone drunk on grief. And I said, I'm so sorry. This is just, this is just gross or whatever. And I, my sister-in-law said from the outer circle that was watching me, it's not gross. It's beautiful. I don't know if she meant that or not. I can take her at her word. But I think sometimes we exist in both places. People think it's gross and beautiful at the same time. And the part of us that thinks it's gross is the judgmental society part of ourselves that think things should be a certain way. And then the part of us that is understanding the beauty of that is the truer part of ourselves. It's the part of me that is crying. Um, the real truthful part. And uh, I mean, you got to control yourself because you have to get through life and go to the grocery store. So you can't just be a mess all the time. But when I, when I'm singing and when I'm crying and all this stupid, seemingly stupid stuff I'm doing, it's living as it's the truth of myself. And I guess that is beautiful, but it's also kind of gross too. I don't know. It's tough. <laughs> We live in a society where obsession is something wrong. You're you're either psychotic, you're a stalker, you're uh, obsessive nature is perceived as something very negative. When in fact, our predecessors, our ancestors, realized everything they did because they obsessed. Some well, of them yeah, were obsessing about what they were doing all the entire lives to create what they did to perfection. Yeah. I, I think that's, this is kind of another conversation in a way. Um, I feel like we haven't touched on my obsession really. It, that, that's how obsessive I am is we could, the, 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 the streets and avenues we could go down would boggle your mind. Um, but yeah, it's funny that we live in a time now where um, people look at a, typical things that would be shown in a love story, like in a movie 40 years ago. And they're like, Oh, that's creepy. Right. The way that guy is behaving is creepy. It, and I see it in my own work, right? Like I mentioned the song, the list earlier and the chorus of the list says, I write your name for days and I buy records to play. I wait in the park or I watch your front door. Now that if you want to just look at that on the surface, What's this guy doing just watching this girl's door? What's, what is that about? What is he hoping to accomplish? That's where our minds go nowadays, right? Everything is, 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 a, is a, we're trying to take it down. We're trying to find out who the villain is. I was just a kid, both truly obsessed with someone. I wanted to see her all the time. But I was also like playing. I was playing in the, the, the realm of what it was to be someone who's in love. And I thought, that's about wanting to see someone all the time. <laughs> like it, it was this, this two headed thing that was happening. And now people look at it and like, you watch your door. What kind of creep are you? Well, I don't know. I'm just a guy doing what he thought was the thing to do. And I meant no harm to anyone. The fact of the matter is there are people who want to harm people when they're stalking them, but that's not me. And it's not the fucking vast majority of the world. Okay. We're always dealing in these minor incidences in the name of trying to protect someone. Well, how do we live life and just try to have experiences as human beings when we're monitoring and, and editing our every moment so we don't fall on the side of what's perceived to be wrong, you know? I don't know, what's, but like I say, this is a different conversation. I, I love it. Like, I, I, since since I became like aware of my obsessive nature and, and the way I would apply it both to the Misfits band and to the Sweet 16 specifically. Um, 
I became obsessed with people who go far, who try, like, who, who, like they, they give everything they have. Um, like there's a, there's a movie called, uh, is it Tim? Tim's Vermeer. Have you seen that documentary? That painting? Yeah. He's, he's a guy who was like a software developer for Microsoft. So he had all this money and he decided to step away and just devote his time to figure out how Vermeer painted a specific painting. And he spent years like trying to teach himself to paint and then trying to understand, well, how did they get this aspect? And he built this, this really influenced me when I built the room for the cover. He built a room that was the identical to the Vermeer room with this facing the same way so that the light would be the same and everything like that. And he tried to paint from that perspective and he just do, did all these steps to try and get to the heart of what he was fascinated with in this painting and he does it ultimately and and it's a trick he finds that it's a trick that that was used and it's about using a like a specific glass that lets you look at the thing you're looking at and paint right next to it so that the value of the paint is the identical value that you're seeing in real life I love that film. Uh, and there's 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 a documentary that came in this black metal. I don't know if it's black metal or not, but it's like a hyper aggressive, maybe death metal record by a band called the the Berserker, and it's a documentary called like something like uh like the life and process of the Berserker, and he's making this record in this in his bedroom, and he does it for like over a year, and he gets other people involved and the music he's making is so technically demanding that it almost can't be performed by human beings. He made it on a computer first and then wanted real people to play it. And there's this incredible moment where he had a guy sleeping on the floor of his studio so that he could just work all day long and then sleep and then work some more. And there's a moment where they're trying to play this guitar passage that's so difficult that he gets two people, one guy to do it with the left hand and the other guy to pick with the right hand so that they can concentrate absolutely on that one aspect so that they're not dividing the mind between both hands. It, it takes hours and hours and hours to do this passage, which is probably only 30 seconds long or something. And uh, I just, I loved it. I found it so fascinating. And one of the things I love about it is when other people get involved and, and, and submit themselves to someone's crazy idea like that. Like I find it really beautiful, and uh, it's uh, it's kind of like Wendy, I guess. You know, she's like made herself a part of my madness and the other people I worked with on my record. And there's a band called Destroyer, and it's one guy. It's Dan. I know him a little bit, and Dave, the guy who worked on my record with me, is in his band. But Dan does everything. And he makes this whole record and then he brings a band together to perform it. And I always find it really beautiful. It's usually about a six piece band. And when I watch them live, I just think about it. He stands in the center of the stage and all of them are looking at him and they're playing this music and they are enacting his interior life for other people, but they're putting themselves into it. And it's, it's such a giving act and I just love it. So that's one of the things I love about when obsession, obsessive work artwork involves other people i find it really something extra it's a dimension that i like so ever since i was little i was obsessed with the people i listened to i wanted to know everything about them because i knew for the most part the beatles kind of are a little more general but you know if i listen to townsend say or milo ackerman from the descendants or bill stevenson from the descendants the main two songwriters i wanted to know everything because i knew they were speaking from a specific viewpoint of their own experience and i wanted i it, it affected me so much that i wanted to know more and so i decided that was a way i was going to operate and there are plenty of people who are like the more you know the less art can affect a person because they have a more difficult time inserting their own experience over top of what you're putting out and i get that i think there's value in that idea and, and in that way of operating but I also think there's a value in knowing, especially if you're someone like me, who I think my art is pretty good, but it's not, you know, world class or whatever. But this thing I made, when you put the words and the pictures and the music and the intent together, this thing, mine would be the sun, is like nothing else that has ever existed. It is a singular piece of work, and that makes it important. Um, 
on on any one of those components alone, eh, sure, it's fine. It's entertaining, whatever. Together, it's something. And it's just like what you say. Like, I think there are, say, painters. You show me a painting by a certain person, maybe, and, and it stands on its own because it's so fucking incredible, right? Like, it's just, it's a monumental piece of work. Most people are not making monumental work. They are making good work, a provocative work. Add more context to it, it becomes something else, right? You know, when I, when I talked earlier about every person's life is a story being written all the time, well, the people in that story, the person who is the author, they're in it 24-7. We can never understand the depths of their experience. No one will ever know what I went through to make mine would be the sun. It would make you weep if you could understand what happened during the making of this album. And all I want is for people to know, but they can never know, and they never will. And it's it's a sadness, but it's a truth. I did read somewhere that uh, you spent your life savings. Not my whole life savings, but a lot of money, a, an amount of money that would it would affect my life significantly if I had that money now, because um, I have no income at all. So. Uh, you know, I have some money saved up and my house is paid off, so I have not very much expenses. Um, but yeah, the money I spent on the record, it's it's gone and it's it's important because I got to do what I needed to do, but uh, it's also kind of sad because, and it's silly, like that, it's, it's a silly thing to do. Most people wouldn't do what I did with that money. Like that's not a normal person's choice, right? And I sometimes, go maybe i'd made the wrong choice but again there's a part of it that's like well no it has to be what it is that that's what had to happen and and i talk about that the way i live the, the very sort of like principles of my life some of them are stupid and they have no application in the real world but uh i feel like if you don't have principles what do you have like living to them is all there is because the outside world can do and take what it wants but if you have these things inside of you that you live to these limits that you have uh that's something that can never be removed and it's it is a sort of a it is a it is a way of living and it's uh i don't know it's silly it's silly but it's also super authentic and true Yeah.